So thank you all for attending this evening. This is our first public meeting for the Metra UP North Rebuild Fullerton to Addison project. And we're ex excited to share um, the project details with you this evening. Um, my name is Jamie Jacobs and I work on community outreach for the project and I will be your moderator for this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few items. As you can see, we do have live American Sign Language interpretation this evening. We will also be recording it to share on the project's website so you can refer back to it or share with any family, neighbors, or friends. A video with Spanish subtitles will also be made available online a couple days um, after, so probably next week or the following week. Um, our agenda for this evening includes an introduction from Alderman Wagesbeck, the presentation, and then a Q&A in which we will address the frequently asked questions that you provided during the present or during registration. If you have a question throughout the presentation, please type it into the chat box or the Q&A section. Um, and we will try to address it during the Q&A. But even if we don't address it, no worries, we will be posting a frequently asked questions document on the project's website as well. Um, and without further ado, I'm actually going to introduce Kate Sullivan, who is with the Metra team. Good evening. My name is Kate Sullivan. I'm a project manager for the environmental review process for the UP North Rebuild Project. We've assembled the project team to introduce the UP North Rebuild Project to you this evening. Joining us are the environmental review team from CDM Smith and Purple Group, the design team from Alfred Benish and Company, uh, Union Pacific staff, staff from Metro's Community Legislative Affairs and Project Delivery Departments, and Metro's Director of Communi Communications, Michael Gillis. We request that all media reach out to Michael directly with any questions. His contact info will be provided later in the presentation. And on behalf of the whole project team, I'd like to thank you um, for your participation in uh, tonight's virtual public meeting. We're also happy to welcome um, 32nd Ward Alderman Scott Wagesback. Uh, if he was able to access this. Um, I, uh, hang on, um, we are making sure that he is on. If you could please bear with us just a moment. So it looks like he might not be on just yet. Um, if he does um, join us, uh, feel free to chat us in the chat box, Alderman, and we will bring you on screen. Um, just let us know that you're here. We don't see you in the attendees, but just let us know and we will pause for a moment and let you say hi. So you guys can bring it back to me if that works, to my tech team. Cool. So yeah, just wanted to go over the presentation um, with you guys for this evening. We will be going some over some overview and benefits, the work, environmental review, cost and funding, what you can expect from the project and construction. Um, how we manage, how we plan to manage outreach with you all, and then a Q and A, like I said at the end, which will be um, about fifteen to twenty minutes. Um, so, without further ado, I will kick it off to Steve Hands, the consultant project manager. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, again, my name is Steve Hands. I work for CDM Smith on the environmental review team. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk a little bit about this project and the benefits uh, that, that we'll see um, moving forward. Uh, in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the 11 bridges. You can see them presented um, uh, on this map in just a moment. Uh, these are the 11 bridges between Fullerton and Cornelia that will be replaced as part of this project. Uh, the project will also replace retaining walls between uh, Fullerton and Addison Street along the Union Pacific North Line, uh, where it's necessary to, to support the rail, the tracks. Uh, 
Um, you'll notice that these the bridges here are, are showing up with the, the images on either side. Uh, they run from, from south to north, uh, starting at Fullerton. There's also the, the Clybourne Avenue, the Wrightwood Avenue, Diversity Parkway, Wellington Avenue, Berry Avenue, uh, Belmont Avenue, Melrose Street, School Street, uh, Roscoe Street, and Cornelia Street. So I'm guessing many of you that are here on the uh, on the this um, presentation uh, are very familiar with at least one of these bridges, uh, and that's why you're here tonight. Um, we go to, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the other improvements that this project will entail. Um, so the, the tracks will be shifted uh, to better align with the existing tracks north and south of the project area. Um, roadways at Cornelia and Roscoe will be lowered to maintain vertical clearance for vehicles traveling under the bridge, as well as uh, vertical clearance for the Metro trains under the CTA Brown Line Bridge, which crosses over in that area. The Lincoln and Addison Street Bridge will be uh, uh, refurbished and painted. Um, it will remain in place, uh, supporting the trains across, uh, across those two streets. And there will also be utility work um, uh, along the corridor to support construction. Some of the benefits that we wanted to highlight for you tonight about the project is that this will modernize infrastructure. The bridges that you've seen in those images are 120 years old. Um, the, anybody that lives in the neighborhood uh, or works in the neighborhood and walks under those bridges, you know what they, they currently look like. Uh, this will allow uh, Metro and UP to modernize their infrastructure and, and, and uh, replace uh, bridges that are significantly past their expected use, useful life. Um, these bridges are, are, are certainly safe, they're, they're maintained, uh, but that maintenance actually is very costly. Uh, and so with the replacement of the bridges, uh, it will increase the efficiencies and reduce operating costs by re reducing the need for, for ongoing maintenance. Um, in addition, it will Im improve the bridge underpasses. Uh, so a lot of uh, individuals that may live in the neighborhood at night notice that the, the lighting isn't, uh, you know, isn't the brightest. Uh, this project will allow the lighting to be replaced um, as well as improving uh, ADA accessible travel paths through that area. Um, and then in addition, it will also improve customer experience for uh, riders of the Metro train. Um, it will improve the cus customer comfort and then also reduce the potential for future service and inter interruptions uh, due to maintenance needs of, of those uh, 120 year old bridges. So on the next slide, uh, you can see how the these bridges fit within the, the overall community. Uh, again, running from Fullerton uh, north to uh, Lincoln and Addison. Um, and you can see how the bridges are, are separated. They're, they are quite close together, especially in the area between Wellington and Lincoln and Addison. So I'll talk a little bit about the work and highlight what's gonna, what, you know, what this could look like. Um, it's important to understand that we're very early in this process. Uh, what we're showing you are concepts and, and ideas for how this, this work will be completed. Um, uh, but we want to hear from, from you today and, and into the future to make sure that this is, is being prepared uh, in mind, uh, being mindful of what the community uh, has to say. So on, in these images, you can see what the existing bridge at School Street looks like uh, on the left. Uh, again, that's the 120 year old bridge uh, that crosses over School Street in the project area. On the right is an example of a new bridge that was constructed as part of the UP North project uh, previously completed between Grace and Balmoral. Um, you can see this bridge is a is modern infrastructure that can support the train and, and again improve that uh, resiliency and reliability of that train service. On the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the retaining wall. So again, uh, on the left, you'll see an existing retaining wall just north of Roscoe Street along Ravenswood Avenue. Um, and then on uh, the right side is a recently constructed retaining wall along the Ravenswood, um, uh, along Ravenswood to the north uh, as part of that previous project. Again, you can see it's a, it's a taller retaining wall um, with modern infrastructure and, 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 uh, and separation from, from the public. Um, this also has an example of, of some nice uh, greenery that's been added to the, the wall there just north of Grace. On the next slide again is, a, is an image of, of the bridge and you can see the, the existing limestone abutments uh, were retained in a portion there uh, as part of the previous project. Um, and then the bridges uh, beyond with uh, the in, 
improved infrastructure and, and safety improvements for for the railroad as well, including a, a pedestrian, uh, you know, a walkway for railroad workers along the edge of that bridge. So one of the big things that we wanted to express today is the proposed uh, approach to constructing this. And this is a very similar approach as you may have noticed um, from the previous project, again, between Grayson Bill Morrill that, that was recently completed where those bridges had been replaced in stages. And so in general, we're gonna walk through these different stages. There are two main construction stages. Um, we're gonna show you uh, some, some uh, drawings of the overall uh, approach. Again, these are not to scale. These are really just concepts being presented. Um, can you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Uh, so the existing bridges have three bays. There's a southbound track on the, the east side, a northbound track in the middle, and then an unused bay along the west side of the corridor. Um, uh, this project will take advantage of that, that space that that unused bay is in. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the first phase, the first stage of this project, stage one would be to uh, demolish the unused third track bay construct a new northbound bridge outside of the existing operating tracks um, for both the north and southbound tracks uh, to the west of those existing operating tracks, which would allow those two existing uh, metro and UP tracks to retain, remain in service during the rush periods to allow both northbound and southbound service to, which would limit the impacts to operation to those train service during construction. In the next stage, uh, trains, the northbound trains will now operate on the new bridge. Uh, the southbound trains on the existing uh, uh, old bridge uh, to allow for the, the construction of the new southbound bridge in between those two structures. Again, this maintains that the uh, tracks in both directions for two, two track service. Uh, in the final condition, you can see that the, the, the new bridges will be complete and they will be shifted a little bit to the, you know, to the west. Um, based on that, uh, that staging. All of this occurs within existing railroad property, um, and it also preserves space within that railroad property for a potential future third track uh, if, uh, uh, at a later date. Um, the next few slides will just kind of show how that looks between bridges. So a lot of uh, the area has, is currently on embankment. Uh, there are some retaining walls that, you know, shorter retaining walls and some slopes. Um, so we're going to show you a little bit about how this, uh, this process would work um, on these, these slides. So in this existing condition, you can see the two tracks that are currently out, uh, out there today, a northbound on the west and uh, the, the southbound track on the east. To go to the, uh, you can see that there's vegetation that's, that's to the west of the, the corridor currently um, on railroad property as well. So we go to the next slide, we can see the first stage is to construct a new retaining wall to support uh, the shift of the track for the new northbound track. And so you can see that under construction in this slide. Um, during, during that construction, uh, there will need to be some removal of vegetation. Um, uh, and we just wanted to highlight that as part of this presentation. In the next, the next slide, um, you'll see that the new northbound track will be operating on that northbound track. Uh, and allowing for a new southbound track to be constructed between the two uh, usable tracks. And then in the final condition, you can see how the tracks have now shifted to the west, uh, that where that retaining wall is, and that there, and then the space available in public way in some locations for um, for new uh, new landscaping or vegetation to be added. So again, as I noted, this was the same type of staging that was con completed as part of the previous project between Grace and Balmoral. You can see these aerial images of the track structure in 2012, and then during construction in those different stages in 2016 and 2020, and then the final condition there in 2021 with those the new bridges being completed and the tracks being shifted to the west. So now that we've explained a little bit about how that uh, how the construction staging could occur. I wanted to go through a little bit of the environmental review process and what to expect. So during the environmental review process, we, we work to examine and identify potential environmental effects of the project. Uh, we follow uh, the National Environmental Policy Act um, as part of that environmental re review process. This is required for any projects uh, receiving federal funding. The Federal Transit Administration 
uh, has determined that uh, this project will uh, require a documented categorical exclusion. And so that is, that's the document that we're preparing. And it really just reviews uh, the analysis that was conducted to identify potential effects and, and make sure that there, there aren't uh, adverse effects as, uh, associated with the project or significant effects on the environment. The environmental review process has started, and, and the, the results of that environmental analysis we plan to share at, at uh, a second public meeting. The reason why we're having this meeting is certainly to get your feedback to let you know about the project so that that environmental review process can incorporate the uh, you know, feedback that we've heard today. Uh, the, this next slide talks a little bit about the National Environmental Policy Act and what's included underneath it. Uh, it really uh, encompasses a, a wide variety of areas that we look for for both environmental and community impacts, um, including uh, um, noise and vibration analysis, uh, looking at parks and recreations, looking at hazardous materials, and, uh, and as well as wetlands and, and other uh, um, threatened and endangered species. In the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the noise and vibration analysis. Uh, during the registration, we did receive several questions about this, um, and uh, it's obviously something that we wanted to highlight being that this is a railroad corridor and there are some changes to the railroad infrastructure being planned. Uh, so the noise and vibration analysis that we conduct is, uh, it follows the, the requirements and the procedures set out by um, the Federal Transit Administration's guidelines in their, their noise and vibration impact assessment manual. And we start by first measuring existing noise and vibration conditions. Um, in this image, you see, uh, you know, um, with the bridge in the background, a measurement a measurement equipment that has been used to uh, to measure the existing um, noise levels and vibration levels within the community. You may have seen some of uh, our team members out doing these measurements um, uh, in previous months. Uh, after you, after we're able to obtain the existing noise levels, a model is developed, and then we val validate that model based on those uh, those noise and, and vibration level measurements. Um, the The model is then used to um, model what out what uh, the changes would be with the proposed conditions. In this case, with shifting the tracks to the west, and and with the change in infrastructure that's being proposed. Um, then, based on the 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 new conditions and the and the existing conditions, you're able to identify whether there's a change in noise levels and whether that change uh, it becomes an impact, uh, and whether or not there are new design changes or mitigations that should be considered to minimize those noise uh, levels. There's also an assessment of construction related noise as part of this process. In the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what uh, mitigation looks like or design changes to minimize the impact of. Uh, of noise or vibration. Um, so moderate or severe impacts as they're defined in the Federal Transit Administration's manual will require consideration of mitigation options. And Metra is committed to design the project uh, to not result in any severe noise impacts. Um, as an example, as part of the previous UP North Grace to Balmoral project, mitigation measures at a single property uh, were included, including uh, a noise barrier wall and vibration reducing pads, um, as that was what was identified as the, the impact in that one location for the previous project uh, prior to the mitigation. This project is different, so I don't want uh, anyone to take that away. We just wanted to provide that example of what's been done in the past. Uh, every project is unique, and that's why we're conducting a unique analysis specific to the, the design proposed as, as, as part of this project. Moving forward, we'll talk a little bit about the cost of the project and funding. Um, so this is uh, this project is is total uh, estimated to cost a little over two hundred sixty million dollars. It's currently included in Metro's capital program, and one hundred sixty million dollars uh, or so has already been allocated. Uh, funding sources include the Federal Transit Administration, um, as well as the Rebuild Illinois bond funds. Metro continues to pursue additional funding to to support this project. With that, I will turn it over to Colin Fleming, my colleague here, uh, to talk a little bit about what to expect moving forward. Great, thank you, Steve. Again, my name is Colin Fleming. I'm with the consultant project team uh, assisting Metra uh, with this important project. And so I'll go through a little bit about uh, what you can expect as a resident in the area, 
uh, a property owner, uh, et cetera. So uh, just wanted to remind folks where we are at right now. We are currently in the early design and planning stage uh, of this project. This includes the important environmental review and analysis periods Steve described uh, earlier. Um, as part of that environmental review period, uh, we are conducting some field visits. So you may see or may have seen some team members in and around the corridor to, to collect some of this data, such as the noise and vibration readings and monitorings or photographs, uh, just as part of the project planning and design uh, stage. Um, and again, we are just starting, starting off here and wanted to provide information to the public as part of this uh, part of this effort as well. So just wanted to remind folks that construction is not imminent right now. We are in the early design and planning stage. And in the next slide, I'll color, cover a little bit more of the schedule. So again, we are in the environmental review period, which began in spring of 2021 and is expected to last through mid 2022. Um, as part of the environmental review process, we will be conducting two public outreach meetings. The first obviously is tonight. So thank you everyone for, for joining us to kick this off. And we do have a second one that would be planned for later this year or early 2022. And in that meeting, we'll be able to come back with more information regarding the project. As again, we are just in the early design and planning stages right now. Ongoing and concurrent to this environmental review process, we are working through the design process as well. The design team started in the spring of 2021, and that is expected to last through summer 2023. And then probably one of the biggest questions on everyone's mind is when would construction begin and when would it occur? Um, so anticipated construction start is summer of 2023 and would last through 2027. So again, this is the overall uh, project schedule. It is also located on our uh, project website uh, if you wanted to take a little bit more time to look at it. So while we aren't in the construction phase quite yet, uh, we do know that there will be some disruptions and wanted to briefly review them. So. Um, again, the, there will be temporary street closures, detours, um, and construction noise and equipment in the area. Um, we don't have all of that information uh, as we are still in the planning and design phase right now, but we expect to include more information about those at the second public meeting and beyond. Um, there will be a presence of construction workers, obviously, and equipment. Um, parking spots may be needed for construction workers. Um, as work is completed and Metro will work with the contractor to identify opportunities to provide parking for construction workers that minimizes the use of on-street parking throughout the corridor. Um, temporary street closures obviously are, are a big part of this um, and, and that will all be documented in the environmental review process that Steve had mentioned earlier. And again, we'll be discussing more of this um, as we go through the planning and design process at the second public meeting. So as many of you are aware, there are many properties directly adjacent to the railroads um, and on the, on the property line itself. So we do not anticipate the need for permanent property acquisition as part of this project. However, Temporary construction access will be needed, um, especially from properties that are directly adjacent to the railroad property line. So as you can imagine, this is a, a pretty tight uh, area or there are some, some tight areas along the corridor and the temporary access would be needed to reconstruct areas of that retaining wall um, and track work uh, along the corridor. So, um, over, sorry, can you just go back one, Jamie? Yeah. So over the years, um, some property owners and residents may have started using some of the Union Pacific Railroad property along the corridor. Um, and so some property owners uh, will see a change in how they currently use the railroad property along this corridor. So currently some elements uh, such as privacy fences are located 
in the area between the tracks and the railroad property. So these pictures included here um, are just examples to help illustrate that point. So in the top photo, we see a fence on the railroad property line, and that would be required for the project. So the, the blue line is the property line labeled there, and the green line is the approximate location of where tracks may be located. In the bottom photo, uh, we see the fence located on the property, uh, on the railroad property where the proposed track location would be. So again, the property line in, uh, in navy there, um, and the proposed track in, in green. And these are just some of some samples of the adjacency issues, um, primarily located on the on the west side of the tracks. So again, these areas will be required for the project, and we will be coordinating with these property owners along the corridor, which I'll talk about in the next slide now. Thanks, Jamie. So uh, we understand um, many folks may have questions, adjacent property owners may have questions about um, both temporary construction access um, and uh, fences or, or other items uh, in the railroad property. And so we do have a process for that. We have an adjacent property owner liaison, Melody, who is uh, also in the meeting tonight. Um, and if you have questions and are an adjacent property owner, we request that you contact Melody directly and her email is on the screen here. Again, she'll be coordinating directly with property owners and residents that are adjacent or abutting the railroad property itself. So um, we'll give you a second to, to jot down Melody's email. It'll also be provided later in the meeting. Okay. Again, her email will be provided on a screen later in the meeting as well. Um, we also uh, wanted to acknowledge that there are features along and in the right of way along the corridor. Uh, these photos show some of those features along the corridor, some gardens and art installations. Uh, obviously the Roscoe Village, um, the Roscoe Street sign uh, on the bridge there. Um, so we are aware that there are many important features located along along the railroad property and along the corridor. So Metro NUP and Union Pacific will be coordinating with the appropriate stakeholders and groups um, as these areas will also be impacted as part of the project. So we'll be initiating some of that ongoing coordination uh, with, with some of these groups uh, as we proceed through the planning and design process. Um, if you are one of those groups, uh, you can feel free to email us at the project email, which we'll again provide later in the presentation. So now I will hand it back over to Jamie to walk us through the outreach process. Thanks, Colin. Um, so like you said, I will be going over some outreach. Um, as I mentioned previously, while I'm your moderator this evening, I am part of the public outreach team. So what does that look like? As Colin already mentioned, we will be um, connecting you with Melody. If you are an adjacent resident um, or property owner, please connect with her. Her email address is on the screen once again. Also, we definitely are inviting all comments to be sent to our project email at UPN, rebuild at metra, rr .com. Um, As you saw when you registered, we did ask if you wanted to sign up for um, any sort of future information um, to be provided via email. We are building an email list. Um, so this, we're looking to include neighbors and any sort of community members. So business owners or people who work in the community um, any sort of community groups, neighborhood organizations, or homeowner or condo associations. Um, if you said, no, you didn't want to sign up when you registered, but now you changed your mind, just shoot us an email at UPN, rebuild at metrarr.com. Um, also, as we mentioned previously, we will be hosting a second public meeting to help keep you informed on project details and updates. So what do next steps look like? You're at this meeting, what comes next? Um, as we mentioned, when we went over the timeline, we will have, or we will be continuing design development and the environmental review. 
Um, we will also be coordinating with um, adjacent property owners. Um, thank you to Melody, um, the aldermen's offices, the condo associations, and any other of the any community groups. Um, so yes, please reach out to us via email if you want to be um, connected with us at all times. Um, and like we said, the second meeting will be hosted later this year or early next year. Um, and with all that being said, that concludes our actual presentation for the evening. And as I mentioned, we will be having um, some time allotted for the Q&A. Um, we do really appreciate all the questions that were submitted during registration and plan to go over um, those that were most uh, frequently asked first. Um, and I do see a bunch of questions came through the Q&A and the chat box. So we will try to address those during this time. Um, we do have a little over 20 minutes. Um, so hopefully we do get to quite a few of them. But if we do not get to your question, um, like I said, please feel free to email us at our project email, which is right there on the screen, upnrebuild at metrarr.com. Um, and then all frequently asked questions will be posted on the project's website at metra.com slash upnrebuild. Um, that email address will be available in the next slide um, after we go over the Q&A. So if you um, want to revisit any of the questions that were asked or this presentation, um, we like I said earlier, if you joined us late, we will be posting a recording of this presentation onto the project website, as well as the presentation slide deck. So without further ado, let me pull up my questions. So the first question um, I have is actually from registration. One of the common ones actually, um, how long will temporary construction access for properties last? Um, Colin, I think this one is best for you to answer. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, temporary construction access would be needed on some of those properties that are directly adjacent or, or abutting the railroad corridor. Um, obviously, a lot of those are concentrated on the south end of this corridor and on the west side, but some are also on the east side there. Um, so we are still working through uh, the exact uh, need and timeline of those, um, but you know the construction period will last five years, and it's not expected that that construction access would, would be needed that uh, entire timeline. But again, the construction staging and timing and schedule information will be provided in more detail um, at the second public meeting, so we can provide a little bit more information for property owners to give them a better sense of um, what that might look like. Awesome, thank you, Colin. Um, this next one, Kate, I'm gonna have you answer this one. Um, will there be a new Metro station added along the project corridor? The current project includes bridge replacements and refurbishments, track alignment and retaining wall replacements, but a new station along the project corridor is not being considered. Uh, the closest Metro stations to the project include Clybourne to the south and Ravenswood to the north. Awesome, thanks, Kate. Um, Steve, this next one's going to be for you. What will the detours for streets, bikes, and pedestrians look like during construction? Yeah, as Colin and I have talked a little bit about already today, we're very early in the process. And so part of that design process is identifying the detours and the, the plan to maintain traffic uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists and automobiles and buses throughout the corridor. We don't have the details yet today, uh, but it's something that we're, we are striving to get for you as part of our future meeting. But it is um, based on similar work, there, there will need to be some closures of, of streets to accommodate bridge demolition and installation. Uh, uh, the duration of that is still needs to be determined based on the design as it's being developed, but we hope to get you some more answers at the, at the next upcoming meeting. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. This next one is also for you. How long um, will construction last at each bridge? Oh, you're muted, Steve, I believe, or the sound went out. I apologize there. Technical difficulties. Um, I... As I spent uh, a fair amount of time talking about with the phasing, there are two main stages of the work, uh, and so the bridges will be replaced uh, in different stages. Uh, that does mean that um, 
each location will have you know uh, uh, several different points of impact uh, with the demolition of the existing bridges, the installation of, of the new northbound bridge, uh, demolition of another phase, and then installation of the new southbound bridge. Uh, it's, it's too early to know exactly when each of those stages will occur and how long they'll each last based on our current status of, of design. But, um, but uh, again, there will be, uh, uh, it, you know, the overall duration of the project as, as noted is, is 2023 to 2027. And, and, and it will, uh, you know, those different stages will occur throughout that time. It's not as though each street will be impacted for that entire duration. There will be points of time during that, that four year period when there would be uh, direct impacts on those streets. Awesome, thank you. Um... These questions, they're just gonna keep coming to you, Steve. They're all they're all your topic. Um, this next one is, will work begin in the north and then move south? The, which bridge starts first is, is hasn't yet been determined. That design, that, that has to go through the design phase as part of the staging. Um, but as I noted, the, the because of the staging, there will be work uh, on the west uh, of all of the bridges before it moves to the to the the east bridge or the the northbound or the that southbound track that's on the east side, and so uh, it's not as though it will run linear from from north to south. Uh, it will be, um, you know, more of a uh, west to, to east style of phasing. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question I have is, will any underpasses be widened or narrowed to accommodate wider sidewalks, bike lanes, or reduced vehicle lanes? Um, I believe this will also go to you, Steve. Sure. Uh, obviously, the, the streets currently are, they have a certain right of, uh, right of way or, or, or um, public space that's uh, dedicated to them. Most of these uh, streets are, are 66 foot uh, in right of way, and that's about the space between the current walls at the at the bridges and so th there's not really space to to widen or or shrink those those locations um again we're we're still early in the design phase so we don't have the specific dimensions uh set for each of the bridges and locations uh, but generally the the restrictions are more what's happening on those streets east and to the west and and throughout the entire area um than just the bridge itself awesome so this one goes to kate Will these improvements at all help increase capacity of the line because of greater speeds and efficiency? So increased train service is not part of this specific project. Um, and the track infrastructure is being designed to meet the existing uh, design speed that the existing tracks meet. However, by uh, modernizing bridges that are past their useful design lifespan, We'll be able to avoid slow zones for you know future ongoing maintenance, um, which will help with train operations. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we do have a question in regards to access to the Brown Line from Roscoe um, Village. If Roscoe is closed for lowering, um, so. That's question number one, but also will that bridge be repainted? Um, those were a two in one question. Sure. Uh, as I noted earlier, there will there will be a full plan developed for maintaining access for pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, and and road users when any street would be required to be closed. And so we don't have those those plans yet. Um, but obviously there will be an alternative route that's identified for pedestrians to access the Brown Line. Um, uh, during a period of closure of, of, of Roscoe Street when that's that's needed for the bridge or the, the street lowering. Um, in terms of the the Roscoe Bridge being repainted, obviously the, that uh, that bridge has to be removed as part of the replacement. Um, but we are uh, already discussing um, you know different opportunities there may be for for uh, alternative community identifiers in the area and and it's something that we want to work uh, we continue to work with the the chamber and the the Roscoe uh, village uh, neighbors on uh, what what something could look like there to make sure that that community is um, the unique community of Roscoe village is represented Awesome. So I do see a few questions that had come in through the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, will there be something under the tracks or over the sidewalks at each bridge to catch water 
um, or any sort of stormwater drainage um, to be installed. I think I that would go to Steve. Yeah. I'll take this one as well. Thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, certainly the new bridges, uh, the, the style will be different. Um, anybody that walks through the area knows that, you know, in some cases you can see daylight through the bridges. Uh, you know, they weren't designed to accommodate the, the amount of rain that we get nowadays. The new bridges will be uh, designed with waterproofing in mind and to make sure that the water is being directed appropriately to, to minimize the uh, drips and, and things of that nature over the sidewalk. So that's definitely an improvement that you would see with the, the new bridges. Um, the, the deck is, is also thicker. And so it just makes it a, it's, it's much more, uh, ro you know, robust structure for collecting and, and diverting the water to the right location. So Jamie, there are also a number of questions about lowering some of the roadways. I was just, that was gonna be my follow-up. I see some people are concerned about the lowering of the streets and flooding. Um, I think this kind of is answered by Steve saying that it'll be pointed in the right direction, but I'll let him continue that conversation. <laughs> yes. One, the design team gave us some clarification that they really need to sort of uh, finalize this during final design, but they're lowering it they think somewhere in the range of six to 12 inches and clearly working with all the governing authorities about stormwater management and all of those concerns. Um, so that is something that hopefully we'll have more specific information on in the next public meeting as well. Yeah, and it's, it's important to note that that the bridges that, that existed that exist here now that were built 120 years ago also required lowering the roadways and they did it at different levels at different locations. So so this is a, something that's already occurred in the past. It's a it's a similar approach that will be taken uh, at Roscoe and Cornelia. And if you know that area, again, you have the brown line crossing over and uh, and then the um, uh, over the metro tracks and then the roadways going under the metro tracks and there's really only so much space to work with work in. I think another good question was about lessons learned from the previous phase of work. And I think there are a number of lessons that were learned from the previous phase of work, but one of the ones um, that the Metro team recognizes is the need to keep two tracks open for active train operations during construction. And that was um, sort of a design criteria of the new project. Yes, thank you for keeping our trains running. I am a user of this line, so um, it is always greatly appreciated to have the trains running at all times during construction. Love it. Um, I do see a couple of questions about equipment in the neighborhood, in the community. Um, I'm not sure if that is something that's been discussed just yet, but want to open that as a question. What might that look like? Yeah, I. I can take that one. I think um, this goes back to just some of the anticipated general construction impacts. Um, so again, we're not at the construction period yet. That would begin in 2023. So still in the planning and design phase of things. Um, that being said, we do know that there'll, there will be some uh, construction re related disruptions as there is with um, many large infrastructure improvement projects. Um, so you uh, can expect you know, temporary street closures and, and detours, obviously, for street traffic, bike traffic, and pedestrian traffic. Um, and that would all be um, planned out, and we will be able to share a little bit more information about that. Um, you can also expect, you know, the presence of construction workers in the area, as well as construction equipment. Um, you know, at this time, it's a little too early to um, kind of uh, look that far into the future to know uh, exactly what kind of construction equipment, um, but uh, you know, obviously you can expect some uh, construction equipment in the area as well. Um, and again, you know, some, uh, some construction related parking uh, would be identified uh, away from the corridor um, so as not to impact some of that local uh, par on street parking throughout the corridor as well. So Metro would be working with the contractor to ensure that there's some pre-identified locations and spaces um, to limit that impact on parking as well. Awesome, I think we've been covering quite a few. We have about um, 10 minutes left. So let me go through some of them again in case I missed anything. 
So Jamie, I saw a note about air pollution and air quality and whether we'll be having some assessment about that included in the environmental review. And I anticipate there will be a section on that in the DCE document. Um, and we will be posting that on the project website. In addition, someone asked if we would share the noise and vibration analysis. And again, our, our environmental review documents will be public on the website when they're ready. Unfortunately, we just don't have them ready for you today. Um, Um, I do see a question about um, that people have seen the trucks hitting the bridges. Um, so will clearance be added to prevent this or is this a result of um, the new the new bridges and everything? Is that incorporated and being considered? Steve, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so the, the new bridges will maintain the, ex, you know, at least the existing clearance. In some cases, it will be raised a little bit. Uh, but in, in addition, uh, as you may have noticed, I didn't point it out, I could have, but when we showed pictures of the new bridges uh, that were constructed as part of the previous project between Grace and Balmoral, there's a, a, a sacrificial beam that's added to the bridge to protect that, that infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's, you wouldn't know what it was unless, unless someone pointed it out to you, but it's a, it's a piece of steel to protect the bridge. Um, and uh, if anybody were to strike the bridge, it's something that can be taken down and replaced without impacting the bridge in any way. Uh, and so again, that, that vertical clearance will be uh, maintained or improved in all cases at the 11 bridges that will be replaced. Uh, and then that additional sacrificial beam will, will provide protection to the bridges um, uh, going forward. Um, somebody asked a question about if the tracks are being built to allow for heavier trains. And it is my understanding that there's a class of trains that does not run on this line that will be able to run on this line after this project. And that's a benefit of the project. So we could try to um, include some language like that in the environmental document for you, for you to review. Um, someone asked if they can ex expect an increase in train service once the project is complete. And again, that is no increase in train service is part of the project. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions about the dimension of how far west the tra tracks would move. Um, we're not trying to dodge this question in any way. The design is still in development and we're looking to see how far they need to move to make sure that we can protect the, the two tracks of service during the construction period. And so that's that's something that's currently being reviewed. Um, and we're looking at a, you know, a variety of distances as part of the noise and vibration study. And, and that will be more clear again for the second public meeting. We'll have uh, more answers for you on, on that topic. Uh, but we do understand that everybody's interested in in this, uh, this specific item. I do wanna stress over and over again, and I can't say it more than enough, all of the infrastructure that's being planned would occur within the existing railroad uh, property. Uh, there's no um, permanent acquisition being planned. Um, there's no buildings that would be uh, uh, impacted by this work. It's all happening within the railroad property. Um, as Colin noted, there may be temporary access needs to, to certain adjacent properties to facilitate construction. And then obviously there are those, those locations where, um, where the fence, for example, is actually on a railroad property. And so uh, that configuration will change as that railroad property is utilized for this project. Similarly, people are asking about impacts to specific fences or the view on a specific block. And we're asking that you reach out to Melody about that. We're happy to do one-on-one -on -one coordination with certain homeowners associations or groups, but it really isn't sort of the same for everyone in the project area. So it's um, probably easier to talk about that in specifics um, rather than broadly with everybody. So I'm going to switch screens just because it says Q&A right now, and I'm sure people are interested in this contact information. We can continue um, for the next five minutes, but just wanted to have it up there so people can jot it down just in case they got their question asked and wanted to um, leave a couple minutes early, but we can continue that conversation. Um, one of the questions I do see um, also is, will there be any renderings or are there renderings um, available to share just yet? Steve, I, 
Oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead, Colin. You had something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So no, obviously we're at the at the start of the project as as we've been uh, communicating here. So we do not have renderings yet, but it is something that we plan to bring to the second public meeting. Um, some more updated information and visuals to help communicate and help communicate what uh, the project would look like and. Um, Oh, you know, in the end, uh, what the final construction uh, would look like. So that will hopefully help uh, uh, clarify some issues and, and help folks understand what would be occurring. So that would be available at the second public meeting, again, late 2021 or early 2022. Um, just also note that if you registered through Zoom for this meeting, we um, will be adding your email address to the um, overall project distribution list. So you will get a notification of that second public meeting so we can make sure that you have that information. And obviously the, the website will be a resource for information as well. Steve, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Uh, Kate, I think had something to, to note. I, I saw a good question here that said, will there only be two public meetings? We have um, additional sort of scope and time and intent to reach out to certain groups in smaller settings about specific impacts to them. And then we also have time for a third public meeting before construction because some time, some time might lapse between wrapping up design and you know we have to go through this public bid process always for construction projects. So um, that and with all of these email addresses and whatnot, uh, we think there are several ways to get a hold of the project team. Um, and please email us your comments. Um, Based on some of the questions we've been receiving, uh, we appreciate the input from all of you. Yeah, I just want to awesome. echo that. It's it's great to hear it um, from see all of this. It will help us uh, as we're preparing the environmental documents. Make sure that we're addressing the concerns of the community and and being able to show how the project is uh, responding to those those notes. And I do also want to stress: if you live adjacent to the railroad and you have concerns, please reach out to Melody. We're we're happy to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and uh, you know come to homeowners association meetings. You know we we want to make sure that that uh, you understand what's coming and we understand the concerns that you have as part of this project. Awesome. Um, so thank you guys all. Um, we are at the top of the hour. Um, as Steve just said, please reach out to us. Um, Melody's email is not on this screen, but if you email upnrebuild at metrorr.com, um, if you weren't able to jot down her email from the earlier slides, we can help connect you with her um, through that email. Also, our project website is metro.com slash UPN rebuild. Um, and then FAQs, a recording of the meeting and presentation slides will be added to the project website. Um, and then again, if any media is on, I'm not, I didn't see any, but just in case um, I just didn't recognize your name, please reach out to Michael Gillis at Metra. Um, his email address is right there, mgillis at metrarr.com. Um, and I guess that's that's the top of the hour. Thank you guys so much for coming. We um, will be sending a follow-up email once again to thank you and then provide you with all of these email addresses. Um, just to direct you to that project website so you can get all the information you need. Um, yeah, thank you once again. I can't and say it enough. Yes. We appreciate it. Please share the website and um, the project information with any neighbors that you might have that couldn't be here today. Um, we're hoping to reach out to as many people as we can. Awesome. Have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your weekend.